how everybody was doing. Everybody enjoying the Wonder Con so far? Yeah. It's a long time now. Right. Should I see Wanda from WandaVision? I'm gonna need to be chill. I saw Multiverse of Madness. <laughs> Same. <laughs> but there's no Reed Richards here, right? Yeah. For sure, for sure. Everybody else is doing good. That's what's up. So. Alright, we'll be guys in one moment. Thank you guys for coming. We truly do appreciate this. Uh, I'm Stacey and Watkins. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. And uh, welcome to the panel. Um, I just wanted to uh, make sure that if you guys uh, check out our website, Superpower Enterprises, on uh, Instagram. And um, first person that uh, follows me there is going to pull this home and uh, carry it with you to, uh, to, to your house. Uh, this is something I've been working on for a little while. It's a project called uh, Notes. Uh, Studio B, and it's about a project uh, superhero that's trying to stop the piracy in the industry. So uh, I think you might find it interesting. So, just uh, Instagram me at Superpower Enterprises. And, uh, get to that. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Harry Floor. I am a writer, producer, director. AI scientist and a roboticist. He has a real robot. I do have a real robot. That's a real AI the company's robot. called Beyond Imagination, the robot's beyond me, it's been all through the media. This is Neo, my press agent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Neo, his friend. I dragged him up here. I made him come. So, um, I guess he knows more about this than um, As far as I, I'm Neo Edmund. I, uh, I'm a writer mostly. I write uh, comics, uh, animation, books. I'm working on some TV stuff right now. I'm working for Power Rangers. I have, uh, I'm working on a bunch of books with John Carpenter and Sandy King right now. So, um, yeah. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Dan Lifshitz. I'm a senior attorney at Johnson & Johnson LLP in Beverly Hills. Uh, I'm mainly a copyright specialist, uh, so I do a lot of entertainment litigation and copyright analysis. Uh, and I also teach copyright and entertainment law at um, UCLA and Southwestern Law School. So uh, I, I am here to provide the legal perspective on AI, uh, what the legal precedent for this type of technology is, the rules as they exist right now, and what people are arguing the rules should be going forward. Hi, I'm Heidi McDonald, the Editor-in-Chief of the Beat at ComicsBeat.com. I have to share my mic with a lawyer, so... <laughs> uh, no, um, so uh, ComicsBeat.com is a website, a website about uh, comics, comic culture, so uh, I've been writing some articles about the use of AI in comics, and obviously it's a topic that's coming up more and more, and uh, I mean, I'm just basically observing and soaking up stuff, and boy, here we go, here we go. Let's go! <laughs> yeah, my name is Digger Mesh. I'm an omnimedia creator. Uh, uh, I started a studio called Artisan back in the late 90s. Um, I've worked in film, comics, as a writer, creator, artist, director. I think I've, I've touched almost all the arts at some point. And, uh, Artificial intelligence has really grabbed my attention. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I've noticed that a lot of my my friends are, are frightened of it, actually, but I think that it's going to help us create bigger and better things quicker. But we have a lot of problems that we have to figure out along the way. So, yeah, that's it. All right, guys, I'll be your moderator. My name is Mike Fallon, uh, actor, digital con content creator. I don't know if you guys are seeing the movie La La Land. I'm in the beginning and ending of that. I've uh, done other films for Lionsgate, like Amityville Uprising, I work with King Vader on Netflix Dreams. So, the point of this panel, as you guys can obviously tell, we're going to be talking about how AI can either, well, how AI is affecting all aspects of the entertainment industry when it comes to everybody's livelihood. So, uh, we're going to get into it right now with basically. Let's really ask about, like, with, when it comes to AI, I'm gonna have to return this uh, question to the panelists. What, what is your guys' take on how AI would be uh, perceived in the context of ownership? With, with, with what the AI is producing? That's like a Janet question to start with. 
I, I guess I'll, I'll kick things off then with the legal perspective. So AI might be a new technology, but the principles behind it, legally speaking, are actually about 140 years old at least. Uh, in 1884, the Supreme Court decided a case over the copyrightability of photography called Burrow Giles Lithographic Company v. Cerrone. And it had to do with a photo of Oscar Wilde. Uh, where a lithograph company took the photo, started making copies, the photographer sued, and the lithograph company said, well, copyright protects creativity. And what's creative about a photograph? Uh, it's a machine that captures reality as it exists. Uh, so what, what did you contribute to that process? And the court said, well, all the choices about how to take the photograph. You picked the subject, Oscar Wilde. You picked his pose, his outfit, the background, the angle, the light, the shadow. You orchestrated all these aspects of the photography, and those choices are what's protectable for you. Fast forward 140 years, and we're dealing with technology that no longer captures reality, but creates it anew. And the question is twofold, really. When it comes to ownership, who's actually doing the creative choices? Uh, is it the AI being fed a simple prompt and then the computer decides everything from there? Or is it more like a tool, like think of a, a photo filter in Photoshop, uh, where there's AI, there's computing technology behind it, but there's still an artist who is guiding it with a heavy hand. And how the AI is being used ultimately determines who can own it, or if anybody can own it at all. And I'm sure we'll get more into detail about it, but I don't want to take up too much of the opening remarks, but that's kind of the general background of where this technology stands in the eyes of the law. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with, with much of that. Um, and I, I think it's going to be a matter of percentage. So artists, I've worked with lots of artists, I'm an artist, uh, I've worked with uh, filmmakers, and it's going to be a percentage issue, right? Because when you go to art school, or you're going to be a writer, and you study all these other authors, all these other artists, and you get uh, inspiration, you get some of your style from them, and AI is doing the same thing. The question is, is uh, when it makes something that's too close to an artist's style, I think then it's going to be a copyright issue. So and ultimately, I think it's going to be a really fuzzy area of what percentage uh, was used. And I think there's also the issue of um, is it legal to take someone's body of work and train the AI with it without being paid? Um, and they're going to counter, well, all that is on the internet for a human to look at. So I think it's going to factor in what can a human do and put the same rules for the AI. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think the percentage of, of, of use from the individual artist is really one of the biggest factors. And then the way that the computer decides to mix things together, you know, if I enter prompts and he enters prompts at the same time, we'll get different results. Anyway, um, I do feel, you know, that there are similarities between a lot of the comparisons that people draw, you know, even at the dawn of, uh, you know, commercial illustration, photography, how a lot of those things cut over each other. You know, where, where artists are using clips from magazines and using bits and pieces from other people's work for influence. Um, but I do think that the biggest hump that we have to get over is uh, sort of a payment system. I think there needs to be a payment system or and a credit system. If a certain percentage of somebody's work is used, I think they need to be acknowledged and, you know, ideally, you know, paid some sort of profit share. Well, I'm just curious about the idea of the fair use portion of it. And, you know, I'm still going to stick to, like, creatively where my vision wants to take the story that I'm going based on what the studio leads about. So this bill is trying to take over our, our, our property, and it's, it's a villain, a, a computer, you know, I'll have this conversation as to how do we stop that? You know, you're talking about it from you know, how you get paid. I mean, a lot of people are worried about their jobs. At the end of the day, I'm just reading something from the WGA and uh, how they're going to try to make scripts based on uh, these computers and spinning out full projects over maybe a few weeks, which otherwise would have taken a year. And those projects will be accepted if there's a human being accredited, right? Is that well, the same that's article? That's the only way to really make it work. Why 
by having humans around if, it, <laughs> right. if, they, if there's going to be computers that's running everything. So it's just, uh, it's, that's the question, you know, the copyright, you know, where, where do we get our legal stance on this? Well, I mean, I think, I think this is really going to evolve. I mean, I will say with comics, particularly, um, you know, comics storytelling is so about nuance and subtlety, and like you can put all the prompts in the world into it, but it's not necessarily going to give, you know, that special touch, and that special moment, or that, you know, little proximity that makes really great comics. And, um, you know, we, we've looked at them, and they're all like these, um, you know, cyberpunk stories, because that's what it looks like at this point. Of course, it's going to change, it's going to get further. Um, you know, what is the ownership? I mean, in comics, for sure, like the, the AI comics that I've seen so far that um, are sincere, there is a human element to it, and there's then a human guiding them and fixing them to make them make them better stories, because the computer is not making great comics yet. yet. And I don't know if they ever will. I mean, I, 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 I mean, the Photoshop example comes up a lot of times, and, you know, which is accepted as a tool now. I mean, I'll tell you, as an old user, it's like every time one of these technologies comes along, you know, I mean, maybe is anybody on here remember when DATs were going to destroy music? Remember that? Yeah. 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 And does anybody, you know, you know, it was a digital audio tape and it was a perfect digital copy, and guess what? It didn't destroy music. Um, but AI is a whole new bunch of questions. I mean, it's really up to uh, smart people like the ones on this panel and the ones in this room. It's a lot more to come, right? As we like to say, more to come. Yes, because everybody wants to make AI comics now. Everybody's coming to, to us already pitching AI comics. Like, and, and they're like, oh no, we can own it because we're making the story based on all these images. It's a collection of images that the AI made, but we created the story. And it's like, well, that, that gets into those interesting gray areas. So, um, yeah, the Copyright Office actually just dealt with this issue because their position was we're not going to register AI-generated works because those aren't works of human authorship and only human creativity is protected by copyright. So this one uh, comic book uh, author registered a, uh, a book called Zarya of the Dawn with the Copyright Office and didn't really disclose how the comic book was created in sufficient detail to the Copyright Office. And the Copyright Office isn't in the, map, in the business of investigation. They, they hear what you tell them and they mostly believe it. So after they registered the comic book, the artist went to the press and said, I pulled one over on the Copyright Office. They have given a copyright to this AI-generated artwork. And the Copyright Office actually interceded at that point because they saw the press that was being generated and said, oh, oh, thanks for alerting us to the fact that you, uh, you pulled a fast one. Uh, we're changing your registration. We're amending it and saying, okay, you can have protection over the text of the story that you wrote, and you can have protection over the way you selected and arranged the AI-generated art to tell the story, but the art itself is not copyrightable. And so you have two fair use questions that come up here. One is the ownership issue, which we have some pretty clear guidance on. The second question is, well, the fair use issue of how did the AI arrive at this artistic endpoint? Whose art did it ingest in order to teach itself to generate images like this? How did that ingestion process happen, technologically speaking? And can you really trace the specific output that was created to images that inspired it, quote unquote? Uh, and at that point, are you engaging in copyright infringement by generating these works and then using them commercially? And I have a little bit more to say about that uh, because there is case law precedent on this that can kind of illuminate the issue, but I'm sure we'll get it. Yeah, but well, so they, uh, we can start with a word processor. So I have bad grammar and it fixes my grammar, is it still my work? Yes, it is. Uh, the, the, at the end of the day, when all this washes out, what will be happening? AI art will be generated, AI films will be generated, AI scripts will be generated. They all have copyrights, they all have protection, based on how much did the human input versus how much is it just pure AI. Um, that's just the reality, the sun will rise, you can, put up a big umbrella and get in the darkness of it, but the sun still came up. Uh, so I know a lot of artists who were first, you know, freaking out right around their hair on fire, and now they have a different opinion. Now they've taken art and are creating artwork that would take them months and hours. And that's because they're using it as a tool, 
um, and they feed it all kinds of prompts, and then they spend hours to refine it with the prompts, then they take it to Photoshop and they make changes. That clearly is a copyrightable piece of work. However, if I just put in, give me a monster roaming down the street, that's so generic, I would think that would not be copyrightable. But who's gonna, who's gonna be judging it? Okay. Yeah, exactly. I am. So, <laughs> like, you mean, you know, who's the judge reporting? If me, my, myself, and I. If my prompt is like, you know, a full page of text, you know, with so many specifics in it, like, at what point does that become me telling the computer what to do? That's, I guess, the big question, you know, really yet. So, um, yeah, there's a, there's a principle in the law called the abstraction test in copyright, which basically just says, you know, it's possible to tell the same story in varying levels of detail. I can take a screenplay and I can read it to you word for word, and obviously what I've just read is copyrightable, but what if I boil it down to a five-page synopsis? What about a one-page synopsis? What about one paragraph? What about a sentence? At a certain point, you've stripped out enough detail that what you're left with is not copyrightable because it's just an idea rather than an expression of the idea. The same thing would go for prompts. If you are claiming copyright ownership by the detail of your prompt, well, the more detail you put in, the more likely it is that you've actually contributed expressive authorship, which is what copyright law protects. But there is no bright line where, like, okay, at this point, you've definitely contributed enough. It's always a little bit fuzzy. It's always going to be on a case-by-case -case basis. But the rule of thumb is more detail, more expression, more likely to be copyrightable. I mean, my question really to this is, like, how much is a creator going to care? And if I can create a comic, for example, I'm not doing this, but if I can create a comic that's compelling enough to, you know, put together, tell my story visually, and publish it myself, am I really worried about somebody stealing my images? You know, it's like, well, I don't know. I mean, is this it depends totally on how much you're going to get paid. You wrote, did you write? No matter of how much of it you can say you own and how much you don't. Yeah, it's like using copyright-free music or stock photography right. for a project. If all it is is a tool to aid you in the actual creative components of it, and it's those other components you actually care about protecting, then maybe you don't care so much about needing to protect the AI thing. At that point, it more becomes an issue of, well, to create the AI thing, did I step on anybody else's rights, or could they come after me later, uh, and I don't realize the danger I'm in at this time. So I, I do have a question for the lawyer. Um, so I, I have an, an AI brain that goes way beyond this, it can learn your job. Uh, and then I have a humanoid robot that can do this and we're trained to be autonomous. I could quite easily have the robot wander through Comic-Con, wander through different places, decide what the lighting, what the setting, everything. So are the images that my robot now takes copyrightable? So generally speaking, no. Um, because at the end of the day, the robot, like, even though you created the software that guided the robot, your copyright extends to the software. You definitely have protection in the robot that you created, but what the robot spits out autonomously at that point without further input from you is presumably not copyrightable. Uh, but there is debate here, and you know, this actually came up in a recent case. There's a company called Reardon that made mocap technology that ended up being used in a Chinese knockout format by big studios like Disney. So the, I think the Avengers was implicated, the live action Beauty and the Beast was implicated. So they sued for infringement. They said, not only are we suing over your unlicensed use of our software, we think our mocap software is so powerful and so directed by itself that it is the real author of the films you create. So Disney, you're not the real author of that Beauty and the Beast remake. Our technology is. And the court rejected it and they said, listen, from the cases that have been decided so far, the rule seems to be, we look at who's doing the lion's share of the work. And yeah, your technology is impressive, but it couldn't create Beauty and the Beast by itself. You had a screenwriter, you had a director, you had a producer, a cinematographer, a set designer, a costume designer. There's so much more that went in beyond the technology. Those people really had the artistic vision. They're the ones who shaped the product, so they get the copyright. Now, if you talk about if somehow the technology were able to spit out a fully animated film by itself with maybe a basic prompt, we might be having a very different conversation. But right now, the AI is just not that powerful, so we haven't really crossed it. Yeah, that. so I, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come back to you. Close. I'm gonna, we are getting close. I'm gonna come back to you because um, there are cameras set up here, no one's operating them, but I'm sure it's copyright because the person set it up. Uh, if I give instructions to my robot to run around Comic-Con, 
it didn't choose Comic-Con. And I say go around and take these images uh, in a certain style, then, then it's no different than me having a drone which has autopiloting and I send it around to film. It's still a tool, it's still a camera, it's just a more advanced camera. Yeah, it really just depends on, okay, how many choices can you put in? You have to quantify them. That's what the Supreme Court did 140 years ago. They broke out every aspect of our edition, every creative choice found in the photograph, and it was those aspects in combination that were protectable. So with that photography, the base photograph wouldn't be protectable. It would be, well, how is this photograph specifically influenced by the directions you gave the robot? If those choices are sufficiently creative and are then replicated by somebody directing a robot again, uh, maybe. So the, the video the video's in a booth that people set up cameras and they shoot a video and say blah, blah, blah. They don't own that copyright. They just set up the camera. They didn't choose the context, the people, what's coming in. It, it becomes a really squirrely question. If you just set up the camera right where it is, you're basically, your only choice was, okay, what type of camera was it? What exposure did you set it to? What angle did you pick? And uh, when did you choose to start and stop the footage? If somebody then pirates your video, well, you made only a handful of creative choices, but by pirating the actual video, they copied all of those choices. You have what's called thin copyright, where only a handful of aspects, of the creative aspects, are actually protected. Somebody copies all those creative uh, protected aspects in a knockoff, Maybe they've infringed. It just depends on how closely they hew to your creative decisions and whether you made it. But so, so, so you see how messy this already is. Yep. <laughs> my my thing is, is is good luck, Chuck. Um, exactly. There, the uh, I think there's an easier argument in some cases to you. What did you train your AI on, and um, was it publicly accessible? If it was, you're still screwed. If it wasn't, it was something that was more private. Then I think you may have more claim. Definitely. Oh, sorry. Well, I was just going to say really quickly, I mean, and again, I am not the expert on this at all, but I mean, I have heard that there was some movement to try to embed the prompts as metadata, like in creating an image. Is anybody more familiar with that, like, uh, I mean, about that process or that idea? Because, I mean, there's, there's, you know, this is super evolving, and all these ideas of how to protect the human are being thrown out there. You don't just drop in your, your prompt into the metadata of the file. I think blockchain. Yeah, but I mean, I think that's just a way to trace. It's a way to trace whose work because, yeah, and you know, I'm a writer. It's super easy to, you know, writing is the least valued. I mean, I say that as as a writer. I mean, it's like you know, it's the pain right. the least, and it's the easiest to do on AI. I have put in some. You know, attempts at articles, and I'm pretty shocked by what I got back and how good it was. You know, not as good as me. <laughs> but I, I say that very seriously because you know I write with metaphor and similes. And, you, know, you still have your voice. I still, I have a voice. Yes, that the AI hasn't done yet. Um, but, but you know, like, like art is more protected. It's way more, I mean, writing is protected, but it's just so easy to fudge. We're, art is more protected. You know, music industry has so many protections. Right. And, you know, long ago it was decided for some reason that ASCAP and BMI would be created, and that even if you play the music in the background of a bar, you were going to get money for making that song. And they're really good at enforcing that. There's so many TV shows. And that can't be shown anymore because there's music, you know, wrestling, like they use some wrestling opening songs and you can't even show those matches anymore because of the music. So, I mean, they develop some very, very strict laws about this. And, you know, it seems to me that this level of, of protection is going to be called on again. And, you know, we're going to have to find ways to enforce it. So, on yeah. that, just, uh, this is your question. Say if I went to chat GPT and said write an article in the voice of you. Yeah, well. Uh, I mean, and it came out and it sounded like you. I mean, how, how would you feel about that? Because like, oh, well, that's what the artist are. Yeah, no, no. And I mean, I'm not. I'm. I mean, I'm against it. Right. You know, I mean, I'm against the the. Uh, I'm against the robots taking over. 
Okay. <laughs> no, no, the robots are going to take over. Let's hear from the other side of the room. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I was going to say, uh, we have Josh here. Uh, Josh works in AI as well. He just joined us, our new panelist. And on, on that note, what, what I want to go into next with everybody on the panel, what are some of the strategies you guys feel should be implemented overall, or like tools you guys know of, to help protect against this type of AI piracy? Blockchain. The most Blockchain? Definitely. Absolutely. Got it. I mean, Please. Go ahead. Yeah. The, the biggest protection right now is the human beings that are helping to create a safety around the AI. So as an example, when OpenAI trained this model with GPT-3, they hired cheap labor in Kenya to do that. And there was a lot of racial derogatory statements being generated by ChatGPT-3, and they used cheap labor to augment the derogatory language it had. And what you're seeing now is that more human-assisted uh, trainers of AI models are being used, and there's no better like balance of machine versus human than understanding that the correlation of all this AI is really the safety between interpreting it and being able to understand the value of it, right? So interpreting what AI, is, the power of AI is a human problem, but understanding the value of it is a system problem. So I think as we build more systems, that's where we just need to bring in more people that can understand how to interpret data and interpret these models, whether they know how to code or not, so that there's ethical training around the sandbox that they're building. Define ethical. Ethical meaning that these people are highly trained individuals, certified in some type of profession. So as an example, the value of AI is the domain expertise. The context of AI doesn't work without having a domain expertise. So that's where there's a value in, let's say you want to do something with police brutality or police in general, you need to have people that work in law enforcement to be a part of that ecosystem. And that's what you know, OpenAI has essentially shared is that they're working with industry partners to regulate and to like enforce standards across their internal processes because they, they need that domain expert on the other side. They can't just assume as computer scientists that they know they're doing the right thing. What about Blaze as, as a project? <coughs> application that allows uh, AI to be blocked. So if there's something that can stop an AI that's going out of control one day, what if it decides to do choose its own algorithm and change your whole story, right? And we need something, you know, right away. Why not implement something like a failsafe for, for like Blaze to be in, in, in place to keep us from losing our, our artistic integrity? In control. Censorship plus, you mean? So it's called police and censors. Uh, it's an application that they just recently uh, produced it's within the last week's time. How many people here have played with AI? Hello. <clears throat> and, and how many people have received uh, notifications not to mess with Disney? <laughs> Anybody get blocked for any of their content? Anybody try to pull anything up and get told don't do that again? Wanda. Disney. No. Yeah, Disney, Disney actually has this example. Yeah, Disney's already, you know, they're already protecting their content. Yeah, but you can, you can just get the professional account where they can see the big stuff. And I will say it's not just ChatGPT, but there's so many uh, AIs out right now. Um, the irony is OpenAI is not open, and Stability AI is the one that uh, I think is the most powerful and it is open, so you can put it on your own machines, you can do and create your own versions and libraries, uh, I know people using it for in healthcare to help people with mental illnesses, so uh, I, I see there is a flattening, by the way, between, it used to be very different between images, text, and audio, it's now actually flattening out. Uh, the rapidity of how fast this stuff is going to grow exponentially, you'll see chat TV team uh, seven probably before the end of the year. And, and Daniel, you were saying that it, uh, in general that AI wouldn't be going away, is that correct? That yeah, it, if, even if the, uh, the WGA placed, uh, places some new rules for uh, authors that they want to use AI, they're going to allow that? Yeah, so I'm a, I've been in WGA for longer than I want to admit. 
Uh, <laughs> I was a writer for Star Trek Voyager and created the show Earth Final Conflict. Get out of here. I have a film out called Quantum Quest right now, actually, with Chris Pine and Sam Jackson that excites kids about science. It's on uh, Google and Amazon and, and Apple. So I, I do this technology, but I also do the arts. Um, I would, would have loved to have had this. I could have made so much more teaching material for kids because uh, it's a nonprofit project. The distributor gets the money, but the rest of it goes to create education materials. So, so the answer is, is if the Writers Guild is shooting itself in the head. That's what the answer is, because uh, what you are going to need is instead, the, the best product will always be AI plus human, period. It just will be. And every AI scientist I know, that is a conclusion as well. Every person I've heard in the Writers Guild that has had a concern about AI doesn't understand what AI is. Because I listen to their arguments and they're like, they're gonna take our dialogue and feed it in and then teach it to write like us. And you're like, I mean, maybe, but, you know. I mean, how many of those, like, tweets have we seen where, like, I fed an AI algorithm a thousand hours of X program and asked it to write a script? And they're usually mockingly, you know, bad. Uh, but it, it does kind of underpin the fact that AI can only get so close before you hit the uncanny valley, and you do need human direction to correct for that. Mm -hmm. And it will always remain a base tool. The question is, you know, what you try to do with its output, uh, because A, you're probably going to have to clean it up, and B, if you don't disclose that you use the AI to do the work, you may not think of uh, cross-checks that you need to do in order to clear the, the, the material for professional commercial use. This is one of the reasons why I don't think AI is going to displace this many jobs in high-level entertainment, because when you get a creator to sign on to a project, one of the things they do in their contracts is they will represent and warrant that everything they're creating for the project is new and original to them and doesn't copy or infringe on any third-party rights you can hold an individual creator accountable for that. How do you do that for an AI? Are you going to get the, the algorithm's creator, the owners of the, of the software, to represent and warrant that nothing they generate for you is infringing? Nobody's going to agree to that, so a risk-averse studio is still going to want to get units on the hook representing, no, we are the ultimate creators. We're not worried that we've accidentally appropriated somebody else's stuff through the errant use of an AI algorithm. Of course, a, a, a human does that all the time, so the studio still has to use a third party um, to check things. And of course, I can use an AI engine to check through all similar works right. to tell me uh, if I am infringing. So uh, even in that case, in fact, I will be working with the studios um, and, and the guild uh, on these issues because it's uh, what needs to happen is folks like him and me need to work together to figure out how do we protect people like, like me and him and him and him and him. Because of course I'm an artist as well, I don't want to see it all go away. But I, again, I see it as a very powerful tool. Um, and what will happen is you won't eliminate the humans, but I'll take a 200 person production crew and shrink it down to maybe 20. I mean, yeah. one, one, one thing I just want to share real quick because I think the, the biggest problem that we're all not addressing is that AI runs in the cloud. We all rely on cloud computing to actually run these models. If you try to use Siri without the internet, it doesn't work. Right. So the reality is there's no reality. You know, AI is a, we're in the era of unsupervised learning. This is the next level of what we're calling AI, but we're not AGI. That's what we're pushing for, which is artificial general intelligence. But the value of all this is that it's all discrete mathematics. So when you really want to learn about this black box deep learning or this AI, the reality is it has to run on a GPU or a CPU, which is a graphical processing unit or the CPU. So at the end of the day, a lot of AI relies on the cloud. That's why they're creating new microprocessors to run these models. How does this is relevant to us is that when we need to like go into emerging markets like Africa, India, Latin America, and work with creators, these people are not given the infrastructure to run high-speed internet. So delivering services to them through the cloud is still not a reality. Most of the world actually is still trying to get access to the internet. This is a fundamental problem of technology. So I'm just bringing this up because writers in America have a different problem than writers in, let's say, Dominican Republic, or writers in Brazil, or writers in Africa, or in India. So these are places that the world is still trying to reach, and I just believe that we still need this human augmented experience because we're empowering creators in America, but we're reducing the impact of the systems without the internet.
Gotcha. Yeah, we, we, but we've had, and actually, uh, the number of people on Earth who can access to the internet is so fast growing. Um, in fact, I work with numerous groups who we interact with in, throughout Africa, Nigeria, Morocco, um, who now have access. But the, to address the, the second thing you said is, uh, is completely correct. Right now, you have to work in the crap in the in the cloud. Not so true in about three months. So uh, in three months, I already know they'll be they they, they have created uh, stability AI. And I'm sure OpenAI has the same thing. What they're doing is what you're going to do next week. You're not going to remember everything you saw, touched, moved, and felt uh, while you're at Comic Con. Your brain actually squishes it down. Um, they can now take 100 terabytes of data and switch it down to a few gigabytes. And um, Spilia has already said, we'll be able to do the entire thing that we do on the cloud, on your phone, off the internet, off Wi-Fi by this summer. And then I think it'd be interesting to have some characters that are going in, into these, uh, re restoring some of the ideas of, of man versus machine. Is, is it a machine magic or is it a, a menace? Uh, this type of technology that's taken over, so we, we uh, will see. Yes. We'll see a good Terminator film? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. it'll be but, a miracle. I, I just think there's fundamental flaws in all of the things you shared, but I think that there's a huge opportunity in bringing more of the internet to the world, but there's a lot of infrastructure that we still have, have on an electricity level. And I think that the value of what we are doing right now is really creating ways for creators to create without worrying about their privacy being a problem. You know, I think that's ultimately what creators are trying to look for, is like, why would I use this tool if it's gonna steal from me? You know, why am I gonna give away free data to an algorithm if it's gonna take it from me? To avoid privacy, I think one of the biggest problems is still, we, even though we're promising all these great things, there's unintentional consequences of technology in every bull cycle that happens. Whether it be electricity problems or even, you know, other types of problems we want to get into, but I just want to bring this up because the ultimate value is what are creators going to be able to do in three months that they can't do today? To gotcha. protect themselves or to empower themselves, right? Yes. So on that note, because we're, gonna, we're running really low on time, I'm going to open the mic for everybody to come ask questions. So if you line up with the mic, uh, let's keep your questions to the point. I know sometimes people get passionate and make long, long winded questions. So please uh, say what your question is. If you want to drink to a certain person, just call the name out. So. Hello, this is my first day at University of Body, and thank you for being here. But, you know, we're talking about different things on how everything will come down to percentages, but then that kind of leaves, everything is coming down to the numbers that is becoming less and less viable. Numbers in terms of percentage of how much a person can claim ownership, numbers in terms of time, things that, that are taking months or going to be taking days or hours. I mean, doesn't it reach a point where because of things even taking so less time, instead of fighting for copyright, like in the time of me fighting for a copyright and somebody claim for me, I can write another series sure. and just drop that title altogether and just move on. I mean, with how quickly we can, content can be released, I mean, for one, authenticity can be drowned out because why look for something grand, spend time looking for something really good when there's 300 more books or comics that have came out in the last four days. I mean, isn't there a point where as good as technology, you know, is, and, you know, not even have a fight going against it, because that's just insane. But in the media aspect, it's like, doesn't AI reach a point where fighting for the person is not going to catch up with the technologists, uh, technological advancement that AI is going to fight for? Because we're going to, let's say, we get to a point where for as long as the author does, percent of work, he gets a profit. In the two years it takes to figure that out, the AI can now do 70% of the work. So you can pass the loss to the F as long as the author can do 50% of the work, he gets a credit. But then we reach chat GP 1200 and the book the AI can do 80% of the work. So it really doesn't matter if the author, you know, can do some things that will really matter how much input the author but then to work if within a certain amount of time the AI would be able to do that more in here. In short, yes, uh, because 
the author, the person, the human being is the only one who gets to claim protection over anything. This is the Copyright Office's position. This was decided actually a few years ago in a case called Naruto v. Silver. Facts really quickly. Uh, nature, nature photographer goes to Zimbabwe, takes a bunch of, gives a red, quest, red crested macaque camera. The monkey takes a selfie, and then he tries to claim copyright ownership over it. The court decided, actually, it was crazier than that. PETA tried to step in and say, the monkey owns the copyright, and we're representing <laughs> the monkey's interest in court. That's great. And we want to enforce the copyright to raise money for, his, for the monkey's habitat. Uh, and the court said, no, Congress clearly only intended that human authors would be able to own wow. copyrights. Wow. Because look at the, not only the way the Constitution defines what copyright is for, to further, to incentivize people to create writings and inventions, uh, we don't really have the ability to incentivize monkeys to want to do that through law. Cool. And also, Look at the way the Copyright Act is structured. When you die, your copyright can be inherited by your progeny, but it goes to your your widow first, okay? How do we figure out the widow of a monkey? Uh, they don't legally marry anybody. So this whole regime was only set up to benefit humans. So if we get to the point where the computers are doing all of the work, then you're just putting the work out there and hoping people pay you for it because you're probably not going to be able to enforce your co You don't have a copyright, most likely. You're not going to be able to stop somebody from freely reselling your work and not paying you. It essentially will become public domain. And if you are not doing any human oversight on the generative process, you risk the, uh, the possibility that the AI has ripped off somebody else's work that is subject to copyright, and now you have unlawfully appropriated their work in order to create your AI generation output. So the less human involvement there is on the creative side and the oversight side, the more likely you are to not make money and possibly be sued for it. So I think the law has some built-in incentives to avoid the worst case scenario there. Yep. It's all going to evolve with time. That's good. Gotcha. That means a copyright. Uh, AI can't claim copyright. Oh, correct. We're down to Eventually, the AI is going to say, this is my copyright material, right? And then we're going to have to deal with that. Well, they'll have to amend the Constitution, most likely. <laughs> yeah, so we're down to three minutes, so... Sh so, thank you for coming. And the question I have is back to copyright. If two different people enter the same full-page prompt, the exact same prompt, commas and all, into one of the art the generators, would it generate the same image? No. Different image. So then, what would you talk right over there? Uh, to the extent that it mattered, the prompt that you used, if somebody else saw your prompt and then replicated it to come up with something substantially similar, they would say, well, the similarity is the result of you using my prompt. And if you use enough of my prompt word for word and it was detailed enough, because copyright infringement does not apply when two people come up with the same thing by coincidence. They independently create it without knowledge of one another, then they each have their own copyright to what they create. But if the results of their output were from copying, I saw your prompt, and then I copied it word for word to generate my output, if those similarities in our outputs can be traced back to the prompt I copied, then maybe I've engaged in a form of copyright infringement. Yeah, but I, I think there's a disclaimer that says if you're doing this open, for instance, on OpenAI, and you haven't paid for the premium, then anyone can copy your prompts. And you can drop the same prompt in five times into the same AI and get five different things. Like right now, right? I've done it. I've tried it. For sure. Go down. Gotcha. Next question. It would be the last one. We're down to 90 seconds. Hey guys, thanks for talking to us. I really appreciate the different points of view that y'all bring. There's like the legal, practical, and ethical uh, points of view, which I think are all really important. Um, the discussion about kind of the digital divide uh, really resonated with me, and I, I totally get, you know, there, there was a comment earlier that said, well, you know, it's unlikely AI is going to get rid of a lot of the uh, high executive uh, creative jobs, but I do think there is a real uh, potential threat to uh, artists who, uh, artists in particular who don't have access to resources, economic resources, uh, computing resources, and I speak uh, from that as, as as a, I work at a gaming company, and we outsource the vast majority of our art 
to um, to independent contractors, particularly folks that you know offshore artists. And so, what, would you have any advice for, say, you know, we have Artist Alley like right outside. What would you say to? Do you have any advice to artists who are, you know, like mom and pop artists, individual artists, um, may not have access to, you know, who aren't working with big studios just yet, and who don't have the technical background to build their own AI? Uh, what so, so that's the beauty of it. This is available to every artist. Um, Michael David Ward is, is one of, of the artists in, in my company and a longtime partner. Uh, and so he's been using it. Um, and his advice to every artist out there in Artist Alley is just start using it. Because here's the difference an artist is going to very quickly learn how to use that tool, just like they can use Photoshop infinitely better than me. All right? So people who are actual artists, it's just another tool in their toolkit. Um, and so it's just for them to embrace it and be able to make even better uh, works of art. The, the one thing I'll comment and share is that the value of human-made art is a chain of custody. That's the value of like what people actually you know forget to understand. That regardless of government or you know what we say here on this panel, the value of all art is even from hieroglyphics to now. When you look at traditional artists that know how to paint, for instance, you love their their art because it's 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 a it's an energy attached to it. It's it's a vision attached to it that will never come from a machine. So I think that this is going to be a bridge that we cross where we're going to help more traditional artists convert their existing art into digital art, even if they don't learn these tools. Right? Like an 80 year old traditional artist might not pick up a AI generated art tool, but he may let his work be digitized. Imagine how much art is in the world right now that is not in a safe space that is at the risk of natural disaster that hasn't been digitized. That's like a big bridge I think we're all looking across as we digitize more traditional art in the real world. So the chain of custody is a huge opportunity for indigenous culture and everybody across the world to like digitize it, but at the same time work with new artists that are trying to perfect the derivative game, because derivatives are also a huge space that people are starting to get into as well. And I think AI art is gonna become a driver of derivatives. Alrighty. So, you guys, that's our time. But before we go, uh, who had the Instagram name Bad Mad Flow, or Mo Mo Flow? So you won the poster. And then uh, we have 10 pieces of free swag from, uh, from Digger. So if you guys want to collect it, it's up here at the front. Yeah, and uh, we just want to say thank you guys for coming. Uh, I'm going to give a hand for like uh, all the panelists. Everybody.